Good afternoon, all. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Feeling Your Best with Bronchiectasis Symptom Management webinar with Dr. Tim Axenet, Medical Director of Bronchiectasis and NTM 360 of the COPD Foundation. My name is Christina Hunt, and I'm the Director of Bronchiectasis and NTM Research and Education, and I'm going to be your moderator today. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available for future viewing. Before I get started, I wanted to mention that we will be muting your microphones throughout the presentation. If you're new to the Zoom platform, you're going to notice a bunch of icons down at the bottom of your screen. Throughout this webinar, we're going to leave your mics muted, but if you have any questions that you would like our expert to answer, I invite you to place those questions in the chat. You do that by clicking on the chat icon and entering a question in the box. We will try to get to as many of your questions as we can at the end of our presentation. We have organized this webinar for patients and care caregivers so that they can feel their best and manage their bronchiectasis diagnosis. Last year, we declared World Bronchiectasis Day to be observed annually on July 1st. World Bronchiectasis Day aims to raise global awareness, share knowledge, and discuss ways to reduce the burden of bronchiectasis for patients and families worldwide. We are very excited to be celebrating World Bronchiectasis Day again in 2023. We thank our community for their support of this day. If you're curious to learn more, I invite you to visit www.worldbronchiectasisday.org. And without further ado, we will begin the webinar. I want to start by introducing our presenter today. As mentioned, Dr. Tim Axmet is the Medical Director of Bronchiectasis and NTM 360. He currently serves as a consultant and Associate Professor of Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He is triple board certified in internal critical care and pulmonary disease. He served as chairman of the U.S. Bronchiectasis and NTM Research Registry for many years and has been involved in and authored numerous publications regarding the treatment and identification of bronchiectasis and NTM lung disease. Welcome, Dr. Axman. Thank you, Christina. And uh, I'd like to extend my appreciation to the organizers of this webinar. And for all of you who have taken the time to engage in this very inter uh, interesting and sometimes challenging uh, topic, uh, it's a special uh, uh, good afternoon. And for those uh, global partners that may be on the call, a good evening and maybe even a good morning if those are across the pond the other way. What I'd like to do uh, in this next uh, 30 minutes or so is to just share some information and one be encouraging that bronchiectasis is a treatable and manageable condition. That's the good news. I'd like to share some information on how I think it's best to approach this, but to encourage you to keep moving, to be engaged, and to use this as a process rather than just a single point in time uh, intervention. What we're going to do today, next slide, is talk about some of the options. And again, as mentioned by Christina, there's lots of resources, and we'll review that again at the end of the webinar, that you can turn to to go back and look at some of these topics again or issues. Oftentimes, my experience tells me that it's having to go through this a second, a third, or even a fourth time before some of this sinks in. So again, very manageable, and we really want to keep our patients moving and improve your quality of life. Next slide. Uh, a lot of this is summarized by one of the resources that Christina will mention again at the end of the uh, webinar. And this is a hard copy PDF that's available free of charge through the bronchiectasis and NTM 360 site. Next slide. So what I'd like to do here in this next 30 minutes or so is first just get us all on the same page. I just wanna make sure that we're starting from a similar position I'm not gonna go into great detail what bronchiectasis is. There are previous webinars that do that, but I just mentioned a couple of key elements. I'd like to mention how common bronchiectasis is, 
and then talk in more detail about what we can do to try to manage symptoms, improve quality of life. And then of course, as was mentioned, I'd like to address some of your questions. And hopefully if you have that question, others also have those same questions and we can open this conversation and have a productive dialogue. So first, what is bronchiectasis? Next. I always wanna make sure that we start from the same position and that is it's a dilation of the bronchial tubes. It's not about the little air sacs themselves, but with the dilation of the bronchial tubes, the mucus that we normally make in our uh, airways, it has a tendency to not be cleared as efficiently. We have this retention or pooling of secretions, and that's a great place for germs to grow, cause more infection, and set up what has been termed as a vicious cycle of having infection, more scarring, more pooling. And so a lot of what we do not only is dealing with the infections if and when they occur, but also airway clearance. That is to prevent that pooling, that um, uh, retention of mucus in the airways. Next. And this is just a cartoon representation of a normal airway at the top of the uh, figure. And then again, in the lower portion, we see that the airways get dilated and that the normal mucus has a tendency to pool. And you can just envision that the normal germs that are reflective of all the germs around us in the environment like to set up shop there. And that mucus, when it sits there, can be a great place for germs to grow, cause infection in more symptoms, more scarring, and set up this vicious cycle. And we, again, spend a lot of time then with airway clearance trying to prevent that mucus from building up. Next. How common is bronchiectasis? This may be one of those situations where prior to someone telling you about this, you had never heard the term before, but as you, again, begin to interact, have conversations, look into this, you realize it's more common than maybe what uh, uh, may have been realized to begin with. Next. We understand that uh, there's uh, a probably 150 per 100,000 individuals in the U.S. that have bronchiectasis. Uh, to put this in perspective, tuberculosis in the U.S. is about two or three cases per 100,000. So this is significantly higher than certainly tuberculosis and is far more common. Interestingly, it also is something that occurs far more commonly as we age. And by the time we hit our fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth decades, the number of bronchiectasis cases in the U.S. and worldwide increase. We also understand that bronchiectasis is increasing over the last decade or two. Next about half of the bronchiectasis uh, cases, there's not a specific cause, it's idiopathic, which means that we're not smart enough to figure out exactly why that's occurred. There are some specific causes and that need to be addressed and I'll review those briefly, but I also wanna emphasize that smoking and exposure to uh, toxins in our environment, although it causes many other lung conditions, really is not felt to be a primary driver or a contributor to the cause of bronchiectasis. Next. And this is a representation just as we go across the x-axis in age from 18 to 34 to greater than 75, you can see for both men and women, more women than men, interestingly enough, have bronchiectasis, and it really starts to take off past age about 55. And again, this is not related to something that you've done, something that you've been exposed to, that you've smoked or not smoked or secondhand smoked um, in this way. So again, it's something that occurs as we get uh, a little bit older. Next. So I just want to review again, I hear often and are asked by patients, why do I have this bronchiectasis? And as best we know, and again, about half of the cases, we don't have an identifiable reason, at least at this time. There's a great deal of research and interest going on trying to sort that out so as that we might be able to then uh, correct the underlying problem. But many, if not the majority, are idiopathic or we're just not smart enough to figure out. 
if there's a serious infection and the prototypic example is tuberculosis, sometimes the scarring of the bronchial tubes comes after a very severe lung infection. There are also unusual causes, immune deficiency problems. One in particular is a low protein in the blood called immunoglobulins that helps fight off infection. And when present, oftentimes acquired later in life, it can lead to recurrent infections, the bronchiectasis, and then the symptoms that many of you have experienced. That's something that your uh, providers will be able to check for when you do get your evaluation. There are also genetic abnormalities, most known for cystic fibrosis, not only occurring in children, but we've come to appreciate there's probably an increasing cohort of individuals, adults now, that have a milder form, if you will, of cystic fibrosis that comes to recognition later in life rather than as a child or a teenager. There are other genetic abnormalities, uh, one group called primary ciliary dyskinesia, which is a genetic abnormality that affects the little hairs that line the airways and uh, causes them not to function as properly. So that contributes to this retention or pooling of secretions, in which case then we have more infections and develop bronchiectasis. Next. I also wanna make sure that I'm clear that bronchiectasis isn't an entity in itself and not overlapped with other problems. This is particularly important because when we start thinking about how we're gonna manage our symptoms, we're not only gonna think about just the bronchiectasis part of this, but we also have to be mindful, are there other lung conditions that are present that may be co-contributors to your symptoms and or other areas outside the lungs? So specifically COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is generally thought to be a smoking related uh, problem that affects the airways and or the little air sacs themselves, but that is tobacco and smoke associated asthma, of course, inflammatory conditions that may affect other parts of the body, whether it's the joints, like in arthritis, or the bowel, like inflammatory bowel disease, can also be associated with bronchiectasis. If we have other conditions of scarring in the lung, then a secondary development of scarring of the airways can occur, but it's not primary bronchiectasis. And then if any of us need any treatment for, say, a cancer with radiation to the chest, that too can damage the normal tissue and cause some of these changes uh, that are associated with bronchiectasis. Next. I always want to be clear as well that there's a couple areas outside the lungs that are very often associated with symptoms or drivers. Those two areas are one, sinuses, so that if there's active sinus disease, whether it's an infection, even a drippy nose or other kinds of sinus problems that oftentimes will contribute to our symptoms. And what I share, uh, any of those, uh, any of you on the call today that uh, may be my patients, that if that's present, we can give you medicine by the carload for your lungs. And we're never going to be able to get quite on top of that until it, the sinuses are taken care of. So if there are symptoms, that's something you want to share with your providers. So that's the one area outside the lungs. The second area is reflux disease, and that's acid reflux. It's very common to have reflux, and sometimes it can contribute and drive symptoms. Sometimes those uh, reflux changes are significant enough that it'll actually be the driver of a lot of your respiratory symptoms and much akin to what happens with the sinuses if there's reflux aggravating or causing some of the symptoms, we can give you a medicine by the car load again for the lungs and never get on top of that. So that's something that we spend a lot of time trying to address. As an aside, and I just want to be clear about this, that sometimes if there is acid reflux, we may or may not always have a lot of symptoms of indigestion or require Tums or antacids or other types of symptoms. So that's something to talk to your providers about is, could that be a contributing factor to the bronchiectasis or the symptoms that you have? And like the sinuses, the reflux should be treated if we're really going to manage your symptoms effectively. 
when there are specific infections in the airways or the lungs, those sometimes need to be uh, treated as well. There are other webinars and other resources that talk about some of the specific infections. One is a group of germs called mycobacteria, cousins of tuberculosis, but you remember, do not repeat, do not repeat, do not have tuberculosis. These are just germs everywhere in our environment. They're ubiquitous or fungi or mold that sometimes can cause infection. It's very common to have some germs show up in sputum. And sometimes they need to be treated and sometimes not. Next. And just as a point of emphasis, I wanna make sure that sometimes there's a confusion that bronchiectasis is not COPD, that is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. That is, we think that COPD is most often associated with smoking, first or second hand smoke, but bronchiectasis is an airway problem that's not smoking related. Having said that, can they occur together? And the answer is yes. And for those individuals that have both smoking related COPD and bronchiectasis, they have a tendency to have more symptoms than those with just bronchiectasis or those with just uh, COPD. Next. So let's talk a little bit about managing these symptoms. And again, I want to come back to the uh, what we think may be the root cause. Next slide. And to also emphasize that bronchiectasis is manageable. It is a scarring of the bronchial tubes. And so I want to be clear that once it occurs, that's not going to go away. But what we can do is make sure with the airway clearance and other measures that we don't allow that to progress. The other really important element I emphasize with patients is that your approach to managing your symptoms has to be individualized. And what works for you or for other patients may not work for others. Because sometimes you interact with individuals or you get online or you're in a chat room and you hear about things, gee, this is the best thing that came along since sliced bread and it's worked really well and you try it and it doesn't work or it doesn't really help. And it's not because necessarily that's not the right thing for you. It's just that what works for one won't work for another and we need to individualize. It's a trial and error basis. And I think that the cornerstone or the key for success is to understand as much as you can to be educated about bronchiectasis, to advocate for yourself, ask questions and be empowered. That is to participate in your uh, management and therapeutic plans with your providers and encourage your uh, support and your family and your friends to help you with that. Next. And so they, at the end of the day, really sometimes patients ask me, well, what's the best treatment for me? The best treatment for each one of us as an individual then is the one that's best for you, that's individualized, that works for you and is possible. That is, that agrees with you. If we try something and it's too much, it doesn't work, we don't like it, that's not for us. So again, there's not a one size fits all to this. We need to individualize this and find on a trial and error basis what's best for you. Next. I want to come back to this initial model of the vicious cycle. And again, just to emphasize that this is an airway problem with this retention of pooling of secretions within the airway. Germs have a tendency to cause infection that sit there, cause more damage, more dilation, more retention, and again, set up this vicious cycle. And so there are various opportunities that we can break different points in this vicious cycle to one, improve your symptoms, and then secondly, to decrease or halt progression of disease. Next. So let's look at this vicious cycle and take each one of these opportunities. First and foremost, as I said, and in a circle, is to deal with this retention of the secretions that are in the airways. We want to try to prevent that pooling, that retention. We call that airway clearance. You know, our physiotherapy, lots of other terms for this, but this is in particular 
very important to realize that, again, we have to find what works for you. Next. By doing this, again, when we look at this model of bronchial tubes that get scarred, dilated, and we have retention of the mucus in the lower panel, we want to clear that. The little hairs that line the airways get damaged. So we want to prevent that pooling or that retention of secretions. And that's where this airway clearance comes in. Next. And if we're successful, we clear those airways to prevent that pooling or mucus so that there's no additional infections present, but the scar remains. So our goal isn't to make the scar go away. Our goal is to prevent it from getting worse. And again, the best way we think that will minimize that will be to prevent that pooling or retention, airway clearance. Next. Lots of resources out there. This is just taken from the bronchiectasis and NTM 360 site. Um, again, I would encourage you that as you go through the education, the awareness to learn more about this, sometimes you may need to go back to the sites and this is uh, uh, taken from the bronchiectasis and NTM 360 site, the airway clearance. So for your reference to go back and re-review and try some things and you say, maybe they're not working so well, let's try some other things to go back and refer to these sites. Next. There are links that our colleagues in Australia have a very nice uh, site called the Bronchiectasis Toolbox that is also linked uh, from the previous site to give you some ideas. And again, to do this trial and error to find what works for you. And by going through these different options, oftentimes there are certain things that say, this really works for me or this is too much, or it doesn't work, but it has to be a trial and error basis. Next. So let's talk about this bronchiectasis. The way I think about this, there's a spectrum of activity. It starts with some simple, easy things and then moves on to more involved things. The first uh, part of that is to be active, to keep moving. We think activity, and I hesitate to say exercise, we're not training for the Olympics, we don't have our spandex on and doing those kinds of things, but we got to keep moving. And what that means is any activity is better than none. Most of my patients walk, some ride a bike, some do ellipticals, some do it indoors, some do it outdoors, some do swimming, some do yoga, some do Tai Chi. Point is, it's really good. And from a wellness standpoint, both for women's health as well as men's health, it's great for bone health to be active. It's great for balance and strength. It's great for cardiovascular and it's great for stress management. So at a very minimum to have you keep moving is critical for the management of your symptoms when you have bronchiectasis. And frankly, even if you didn't have any lung problems, I would encourage you to stay active. That really is a important starting place. Once we're get to an activity program that we're comfortable with, then we can start doing things like deep breathing or postural drainage, which means that if we're in certain positions, when we do our deep breathing, we help bring up that mucus. There's something called PEP, positive expiratory pressure valves, arabica valves, flute valves, flutter valves, uh, uh, acapella valves that, are, uh, that many of you have probably tried. The beauty is that there's no medicine there. You could use it once or a hundred times a day and there's no side effects. Most patients would use it once or twice. That's the good news. The downside is it might only work for a quarter or a third of the patients. And what I share with uh, the patients I see in the clinic is if it works, we stick with it. But if it doesn't or you don't like it or it's too much, let's do the things that do help. One of which is again, being active. We've transitioned and really emphasized trying to keep those secretions uh, more uh, uh, less sticky and thinner. And we oftentimes use what we call hypertonic saline and nebulize that, that is breathe in. Our body's concentration of salt water is 0.9%. And so we oftentimes use concentrated salt solution, either 3% or 7%. Again, our body is 0.9% to go into the airways, bring moisture in, loosen up those secretions so that we can then cough those out more effectively. That oftentimes is done once or twice a day 
in the hospital when patients are having a, a, a flare or more symptoms, we will actually do that up to four times a day. But most patients will do that a couple of times a day, oftentimes preceded by what we call a bronchodilator to try to prevent or minimize any cough or shortness of breath when we use it. And then lastly is something called a high frequency chest wall oscillation or a chest vest. And that looks like something that's Velcro wraps around the chest and actually shakes the chest to try to simulate uh, a movement of that mucus and help us clear that. Some patients are able to do these simultaneously to do the nebulizer and the vest and then the Arabica valve all at the same time to make it more efficient, but that has to be a trial and error basis. Sometimes that's just a little too much and we need to do that in a sequential fashion uh, to make it more tolerable. And again, this comes down to, it's a trial and error basis. What works for you, that's the best uh, uh, regimen. Next. I just wanted to review briefly some of these specific items. This is active cycle breathing, where we go through and do deep breathing in a regular pattern and, and on a regular interval. And this is something to talk with your physiotherapist or your provider or respiratory therapist. And that often will help clear those secretions. Next. This is uh, one example of that positive expiratory valve that you blow against. It sends some vibrations into the lungs just by blowing against it. There's no uh, batteries, there's no uh, medicine in it. Uh, again, when it works, uh, we use it once or twice a day usually. It can be done when you use the vest. The, this particular version, the Arabica valve is used that you can put uh, nebulized saline through that, uh, but something to try. And when it works, again, there's really not much downside. Next. This is just a cartoon representation. Sometimes patients find certain positions when you do your deep breathing or the nebulizer or the Arabica valve or all of that, that sometimes that also with gravity will help mobilize those secretions. And that too is something to talk to your provider on a trial and error basis. And sometimes it's interesting that patients describe almost these really contorted positions that they find themselves having the most success with. So again, a trial and error basis, but that uh, should be uh, considered as you're thinking about what might work or not work. Next. Hypertonic saline, and this is just a, a picture that we can in fact thin some of the secretions or the mucus in the airways that has put more water uh, and the air, air uh, surface liquid interfaces, the red amount. And you can kind of understand that if we use this concentrated salt solution by a nebulizer that is inhale it 3% or 7%, it brings in moisture to the airway, loosens up that mucus, so then we can cough that out much more easily. And this is just a representation of some of the uh, work and analysis done to demonstrate that it's doing exactly what we hoped it would. Next. And then the vest, and there's several commercial products available on the market. And this too should be done in coordination with your providers to make sure you have the proper vest and, the, and use it in the proper way. Uh, vest that's used that doesn't fit properly or is used improperly is not gonna work well at all and it won't necessarily be a very good experience. So I encourage you to work very closely with your providers so that you have the right best, the right fit, and use it in the right way as far as intensity goes. And that may or may not be helpful. I would, as an aside, share with you my experience that kids that have cystic fibrosis and very advanced bronchiectasis oftentimes use the best. They love it. They can take a lick. But as we get a little bit older and... Uh, uh, we try the best. Sometimes it's a little too much for us. So again, it's not a one size fits all. It's a trial and error basis. We generally will then start to turn to the best when some of these other measures, that is the being active, the deep breathing, the um, nebulized hypertonic saline, the PEP valve and aerobica or something like it isn't enough to get the mucus up. Sometimes it's a trial and oftentimes 
uh, depending on the vest, you can do a 30 day trial. And if at that point you say thanks, but no thanks, then we don't continue it. But if it is something that's possible, then we will continue it. If it helps again with airway clearance, which should improve your symptoms. Next. So let's keep moving in this vicious cycle. The next is antibiotics. When do we use antibiotics and what, what are some of the other issues that go around that? Next. So as we talked about that, what happens in the airway, we get the scarring, we get this retention of mucus that we don't have sterile airway. So there's lots of germs in our airway to begin with and that those can build up and cause infection. And when they do, we have what we call a flare or an exacerbation. And so intermittently, we need to use antibiotics when there's a flare of germs that cause infection in the airway. And that generally looks like more symptoms, more cough, more sputum, darker, maybe with or without some blood, with or without fever, feeling crummy in this way. Next. And we also have to realize though with antibiotics, the more we use antibiotics, the less effective they are. And sometimes antibiotics aren't so easy to treat or easy to use, causes GI upset or causes a change in our bowel habits. And then we worry about drug resistance. So what I think is really important, what I spend a lot of time trying to share with patients is to use antibiotics if and when we need to, but not in excess. Because again, we understand that the more we use antibiotics, in most instances, the less effective they become. And that's whether that's as an outpatient uh, in the clinic, whether we're in the hospital, or whether it's even when I'm using antibiotics in the intensive care unit, the more I use those, the less effective they become. So we wanna be responsible stewards, if you will, of using antibiotics. Next. And this is just a representation looking at drug resistance uh, of different germs over the last several decades. And not surprisingly, with the uh, use or increased use of antibiotics for lots of reasons, that drug resistant uh, germs have increased dramatically. And this is taken from US data. Next. So when do we take antibiotics? When, when we have a flare or what we call an exacerbation? This is a consensus that was put together by a number of experts uh, um, uh, a few years ago. And again, not that I have to tell you, but you have a change in your symptoms from what you consider baseline, more cough, more sputum or mucus, darker, more shortness of breath, you feel less uh, uh, energetic, more fatigue or malaise with or without bleeding, and then we need an antibiotic. So we use that as some of the reasons to then uh, treat these flares or exacerbations. Next. And that, then we would say, well, what can we do for a more long-term issue? Next. And there are some guidelines that are available. So if we find ourselves in a position where we're having these flares or exacerbations on a regular basis, or in, in uh, the example of this flow sheet, two or three times a year or more, then we start thinking about maybe we should have other interventions that might help decrease the number of exacerbations. If we're having a flare once a year or once every other year or not even that, then we don't want to use a lot of antibiotics or do things. But if we're having exacerbations three, four, or five, six times a year, then there are strategies and medicines that can try to help uh, minimize that. And it depends on what those germs are in their sputum. And those are uh, conversations they have with your provider. Sometimes that involves an oral medicine. Sometimes that involves inhaled antibiotics to try to keep or tap down some of the germs in the airway to try to minimize or decrease the frequency of how many flares or exacerbations we have. Next. Let's turn to looking at how can we adjust some of the inflammation that goes along with these infections in the airways. We generally don't use what we call corticosteroids or cortisone unless there's a good alternative reason. So if any of you have asthma, 
which oftentimes we use inhaled corticosteroids, it's crucial that you continue with your asthma medicines. But if there's not a good reason to use an inhaled steroid, we think it may actually facilitate infection. And we try not to have patients use those unless there's a good reason. There's a specific group of uh, medicines called macrolides, uh, zithromycin or biaxin, clarithromycin, that will reduce inflammation as well. This is a little bit of a tricky business in that we want to make sure that there aren't germs present in the airway, these mycobacteria, cousins of tuberculosis, that would become resistant. But if some, if they're not present and we're having frequent exacerbation, this group of medicines, the z pack or the Biaxin, may be helpful. But at the first uh, point, we need to really make sure there's not mycobacteria present. Next. And then when we look at this macrolide experience, the z pack clarithromycin, there have been three large studies in the last 10 years or so that have come out that have demonstrated that it can be helpful. Next slide. And these graphs just show that over a period of time on the x-axis, the frequency of flares or exacerbation goes down when we use this family of medicines. So again, if we find ourselves having what we call frequent exacerbations, three or more per year, and we don't have mycobacteria present, this is something to be considered and something can be very effective as an addition to try to minimize some of those symptoms that go along with having frequent exacerbations. Next. And then lastly, I wanted to just touch on bronchodilators and surgery. So bronchodilators are medicines that generally are used in asthma to help open up airways. We oftentimes use those before the hypertonic saline concentrated salt solution to prevent any cough or shortness of breath. And then surgery in those instances where this scarring of the airway affects just one very specific type of, uh, or one area of the lung and nowhere else, uh, if we remove that area, sometimes that can be very effective. If we have bronchiectasis or the scarring of the airway throughout both lungs and both fields, it doesn't make any sense to have the surgeon go in, remove some of that and leave all the other behind because we won't be able to move forward as far as that goes. So again, in very limited instances, it can be very helpful, but in others, uh, when there's more diffuse disease that is on both sides throughout the lungs, it's less of an issue. Next. And again, it's really important when we think about management of your symptoms, don't forget about the simple things. Make sure that you have a good diet. And oftentimes it's helpful to meet with a nutritionist or a dietitian through your uh, provider's office or at the hospital. We need to try to maintain weight. When I hear patients telling me they're losing weight, even when they try and it's coming off, that maybe isn't always a good sign. Many of us, myself included, we wrestle a lot with trying to manage our weight over periods of time. But again, keeping our nutrition up is really helpful from an energy and symptom management standpoint. It helps fight, us, fight off infection and allow us to feel well. As I mentioned, activity, and I hesitate to say exercise, sometimes in a formal way, pulmonary rehab, but activity is really important helps us rest, it's great stress management. There's no downside. Not all of us can do this, but there's lots of options. Sometimes it's a matter of just even doing yoga or Tai Chi or something that isn't so hard on our hips or our back or our knees if that's a problem with arthritis. Tobacco products, as much as that won't cause bronchiectasis, will aggravate lung conditions. So I really encourage patients to avoid all tobacco smoke and that includes vaping as well. Uh, vaccinations, for sure, for flu, for pneumonia, and of course, for COVID, it helps decrease the risk of infection, doesn't guarantee that we can't get the flu or a pneumonia or even COVID, but it decreases the risk or at least the severity of those illnesses. And then also to keep that conversation open, as you can understand and see with a lot of what we've covered already today, there's a lot of uh, moving point uh, pieces here, and there are lots of opportunities. And again, it comes back to this is manageable. 
This is something that we can usually improve your symptoms and keep them better, but it requires some individualization. That is, find those things that work for you and then stick with that. And that sometimes over a period of time, we have to make changes accordingly. Next. It's interesting that we got a group of patients together looking at what some of the interests are to try to manage uh, symptoms. This is a, a publication uh, entitled Bronchiectasis Patient-Centered Research. That is what patients told us that they want to have uh, done as far as work in the area of bronchiectasis. And then some of those ideas were to try to improve the treatment and prevention of exacerbations or flares, to the infections, to improve QOL, which is quality of life. How you feel? Are you doing more? Are you able to go shopping? Are you able to spend more time with your family and interact, play cards, do those things that really, uh, you know, you enjoy doing, that other activities that bring meaning to your life? We want you to engage in life. We don't want to have you just isolated. And then the, part of that is to understand and to be aware of what those things are that might make things worse, what makes them better, and what works for you. And then to conduct additional studies to try to find out, are there new and better uh, approaches to trying to minimize these symptoms? Next. So in summary, what I would I wanna emphasize is that bronchiectasis, in my opinion, is very manageable, but it has to be individualized. We have to find out what works for you and what works for your peers or your colleagues. Sometimes when you get online, may or may not work for you. Don't feel disappointed or discouraged in any way. That's just the nature of this. We understand that bronchiectasis is not only common, but it is increasing. My opinion is that airway clearance is the cornerstone of managing your symptoms. What that looks like is going to vary from each one of you. If there are other contributing factors, whether it's a hernia, some reflux disease, or sinus disease, or other kinds of medical problems, that too, by treating those other issues, oftentimes will improve your symptoms that had been attributed to bronchiectasis substantially. And don't hesitate. Find out more. Dig more. Ask. Have conversations. Advocate for yourself and, and, and feel empowered so that when you do uh, uh, go into the office or you do interact with others that you're fully engaged. Don't know apologies necessary. The more empowered you are, the more successful, in my opinion, you'll be. Next. So with that, we're going to start to transition into a question and answer session, and, and we've got some time to, to work on questions. There's lots of resources, and Christina will, again, be able to address some of this. Um, I encourage you to go on the sites. I appreciate everyone's uh, support for World Bronchiectasis Day. It's not only here in the U.S. and North America, but uh, globally, this is a, a problem that has been increasingly recognized, and uh, we've shared experience and have been able to move forward as far as advancing the science and meeting uh, or trying to deal with the unmet needs. So with that, I'll, I'll pause and uh, look for Christina to help us maybe address some of the questions that you have. Thank you so much, Dr. Axman. Fantastic job. We have gotten quite a few questions, so I am going to get right to it in the interest of time. We've got about 15 minutes left of our presentation. The first question they, uh, that we had was, how often can they take their 1200 milligram mucinex expectorant? Yeah. So that's a great question. So guanfenacin or mucinex is the, is the name brand, but guanfenacin. Um, and so it's it, the usual dose is up to 1,200 milligrams twice a day. Um, it generally comes in 600 milligram tablets. The biggest downside uh, is that it's a very large tablet. It generally it doesn't interact with other medicines. It's tolerated well, doesn't cause GI upset but it's a big tablet. And for those of you that maybe have difficulty with tablets, that's a problem. Guafenacin, the active ingredient in mucinex is also in some cough serums like Robitussin, but they also have enough um, uh, xylitol in them so that if you were to take liquid form of it at 1200 milligrams twice a day, you would not have a, a, a form bowel movement for a month and a half. It's, uh, it would really cause 
lots of loose stools. So if you're looking to use the guanfenacin, and again, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, uh, generally well tolerated to use 600 or 1200 once or twice a day might be something to try. Okay, we had a couple of questions along the lines uh, on the subject of uh, sinus issues. How common yes. is it to have sinus problems? Yep, so uh, the, the question is, how common is the sinus contribution to this? Well, and again, it varies from patient to patient. I've been impressed that when it is present, and, and usually um, patients are symptomatic. So in contrast to reflux, where sometimes that's silent, that is we're not having a lot of indigestion and that for patients that have active sinus disease that need to be treated, almost always you're having a drippy nose congestion, hoarseness with or without infections. And that's something that, again, your provider can easily evaluate uh, either with an x-ray or maybe even seeing another provider in ENT along those lines to see if that's a, a contribution. But if that is contributing a lot of drippy nose, a sinus infection, it's really going to be hard to get on top of the, the symptoms uh, attributed to your lungs. Okay. Another question in regards to the sinus, someone was using a nasal spray to help with the sinus, but their nose began to bleed in the mornings. Yes. They stopped um, in preference to the neti pot. Is there anything else they should do to address their sinus problem? Yeah. And again, this is a, a great question. And I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to just respond in a similar way that I did with the lungs in that each person is different. And maybe even throughout the year, there are certain times of the year, depending on where you are, say in the U.S., that it's a little bit drier in the winter months, that some things are not well tolerated. So very often we use salt water sprays. And I might just also add to not use tap water for any of your saline irrigation. So no tap water, no bottled water. Those are no-nos. We prefer to use boiled water and to a lesser extent distilled water, but no tap water. And I just want to make sure that I'm clear with that so that if you are using some saline irrigations or sprays and you're making your own, no tap water, no bottled water. And so again, in addition to that with medicines, we oftentimes have this tension, if you will, we want to dry things up, but if we dry things up too much, then we get bleeding and irritation. And that may vary depending on the time of year, how humid or, or, or dry things are. So that too becomes a trial and error basis. And there are some medicines that are more drying than others. So oftentimes this too comes down to a trial and error basis of different medicines that may or may not be better or less well tolerated. Another question, this one um, says, uh, does dealing with nocardia aspergillus fall in the category of bronchiectasis? So, yes, it's a great. So, um, as we had mentioned uh, or talked about that in the airway, our airways are not sterile. We got lots and lots of germs and those germs are in different categories. So there's a bucket of germs called bacteria, regular germs like strep, and staph and homophilus and pseudomonas and regular bacteria that grow in two days. There's other groups of organisms called fungi or molds, aspergillus, uh, mucormycosis. There's a lot of uh, other kinds of uh, uh, fungus that, that can be in that grows in about four weeks. And then there's these mycobacteria that also grow, but they take about six or eight weeks to grow. And then there's a group of nocardia, which is kind of an in-between bacteria and fungus, if you will, uh, that also grow. And my only point is that aspergillus, nocardia, mycobacteria, or other bacteria can all potentially cause problems. But because they're there doesn't always mean that they have, they have to be treated. We know that our airways are not sterile. And so uh, I have a tendency to collect a lot of sputum to try to understand what is or isn't present. And then those findings, we may or may not need to treat that. But because it's there, if we're not having symptoms or it's not causing a problem, then we wouldn't treat that. The other part of this, I also would want to just emphasize when we're dealing with exacerbations or controlling our symptoms, that if we're having a flare and you collect a sputum, you feel crappy and you've got dark green sputum and you're this and you know that things aren't right and you're sick, you collect the sputum, you turn it in and the report comes back to your provider or you see the report on your portal or wherever you are, and it says normal flora or oral uh, or usual flora. 
that there's not a germ there. Doesn't mean that there's not bacteria there. It just means that there's not one germ that outgrows all the other germs that we can then focus on. There's no doubt that there's germs there, that there's a flare, there's an exacerbation, but you need to be treated. It just tells us though, that there's not one germ that outgrows all of those by that type of methodology in the lab. So it's, sometimes it's a little bit deceiving in that if there's a germ that shows up on a sputum sample, we may or may not need to do something about it. Sometimes we don't, and sometimes we do, but that has to be then taken in the context of your symptoms, of your x-ray, of how you're doing and that sort of thing. And that holds true as was asked for the aspergillus, the nocardia, the mycobacteria, or even the other bacteria that may show up on some of these cultures. Hmm. Another question. I do airway clearance and nothing comes up. Any suggestions? Yeah, so that's a great, that's a great question. So again, this gets down to this uh, notion and, and the, we're, the position that we started with. The best approach is the one that works for you. Some patients, and that historically there's been a small group of patients that have what we call dry bronchiectasis. That is, there's no excess mucus. And so in most instances, if you're not coughing up mucus and the x-ray is relatively clear, the exam is clear, and we don't see mucus plugging on the imaging, whether it's an x-ray or CT scan, then maybe there isn't a lot of mucus they actually cough up, in which case then that's okay. If on the other hand, we're doing airway clearance and we still have mucus plugging, we still have infections, we're having flares, then we need to say, well, maybe that regimen of airway clearance isn't sufficient. So it depends, and I put a lot of weight onto what patients feel. If you're feeling really well and the chest x-ray is stable and the breathing test is stable, then, and you're not coughing up phlegm, that's probably a good sign. If on the other hand, you're still feeling crummy, and we're doing the airway clearance, then that's something we need to pause, take a step back and reassess. Is a tender or sore mouth an expected side effect of nebulizer use? Any recommended treatments for that? So, so yes, it can be, and it depends on what the medicine is. Um, so salt water generally may cause a little hoarseness. It generally won't cause sores, but if we start using other medicine, whether they're an antibiotic or other medicine, say for asthma uh, with inhaled corticosteroids, then we can start to have side effects within our mouth, our throat, and that that does need to be managed. And so very often if we're using inhaled medicine, either by a puffer or a nebulizer, that oftentimes we do wanna make sure that we rinse our mouth out well afterwards. And again, trying to minimize no tap water, no bottled water. Any experiences of bacteriophages for eradicating pseudomonas from the lungs? Yeah, great, great question. So the question is about phages. So remember I told you that there was a lot of germs in our environment. There's a bucket of regular bacteria, the staph, the strep, homophilus, pseudomonas. There's the uh, mold or fungi, aspergillus, and those kinds of things. And then there's mycobacteria, cousins of tuberculosis. Well, there's one more bucket as well of viruses called phages. And they're naturally occurring viruses everywhere in our environment. And those phages can actually attack bacteria. And so now we're beginning to develop and they're not ready for prime time, either naturally occurring phages or genetically altered phages to go after the bacteria that can reside in those airways. So pseudomonas, drug resistant, mycobacteria. So that's an area of incredible uh, uh, investigation and research. Uh, so not ready for prime time yet for everyone, but there are research protocols that are ongoing and have been had some very dramatically successful experiences using these phages. Uh, and that's something to then talk to your providers and maybe even a referral to a, a specialized center to see in those instances where we're wrestling with drug resistant organisms, and there's more experience with bacteria than mycobacteria using phages at the moment, that it may or may not be an option, uh, but not ready for prime time. In three or five years, will it be here? And the answer is, I think so, I hope so. I think it holds a lot of promise, uh, and there's a lot of individuals and groups that are working on developing these as effective strategies. So phage therapy is here, uh, and it's in its infancy, 
And I think you'll hear a lot more of this in the next few years. Um, any in our community have been in this position before. After seven months of symptoms, I was diagnosed by a CT scan. My doctor appointment is not for another two months, so I'm not receiving treatment. Do you have recommendations while I am waiting to see the specialist? Yeah, so uh, the short answer is uh, I, I don't have a good answer for you. Getting in to see any of us, myself included, sometimes is an issue. And, uh, you know, it's the nature of healthcare as it is. I think what I would really encourage you, if you think that you have uh, bronchiectasis, is, is to be active. Start your airway clearance now. There's no reason why you can't start some activity program. Do some deep breathing. Do exercises. Uh, those sorts of things. And I think that that is likely to be helpful. The other part I would emphasize is delay in diagnosis. It's the rule rather than the exception. Patients have symptoms for periods of time. And on the average of maybe between five and seven years before a diagnosis of bronchiectasis is made. And that part it emphasizes to advocate for yourself. And so if we're having recurrent symptoms of having more cough, more flare, we should then start at least think about why are those symptoms always there or not going away? And could there be bronchiectasis? So my colleagues and I have spent a lot of time trying to inform our primary care peers uh, primary care providers, physician assistants, nursing practitioners, family medicine docs, internists, to try to be mindful that if and when we're having symptoms that just keep coming and don't go away, to not wait that five, seven, 10 years before a diagnosis is made to get that x-ray or a CT scan to try to establish that. In the meantime, stay engaged, be active, keep moving, whatever that looks like, whether that's yoga, Tai Chi, deep breathing, or walking or any other activity, it's crucial that you stay moving. All right, Dr. Axman. Well, with that, I think we're, we're at our time limit here. I wanna thank you for presenting today. We'd like to thank everyone in the community for joining us today. If you aren't a member, we encourage you to join our Bronk and NTM 360 social community. We welcome patients and caregivers and healthcare providers to join our community and keep the conversation around bronchiectasis and NTM lung disease going. By joining Bronch and NTM 360 Social, you will not only become a part of an amazing community, but you'll also receive a monthly newsletter to keep you updated on future educational and social events and potential research opportunities. 